Hello, uh, welcome to this presentation on Luke 13. I will apologise in advance, I haven't actually quite finished this keynote. Um, all the contents there, but I haven't done anything exciting with it, like fabulous presentation of bullet points or anything like that. I'm giving this presentation in a couple of weeks' time, and I just wanted to record it now and um, just sort of get into my head what I was going to say. So with that proviso, this is called Of Foxes, Figs, Birds and Kings. And I'm sure you can read. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, here's a, present, uh, a quotation from Deepak Chopra. Now Deepak Chopra approaches God through a multi-faith point of view, including how you can be a spiritual being and have no belief in God at all. Um, but uh, what he has to say is nevertheless very profound and I believe very relevant to people living nowadays in the 21st century. If you don't know him, he's very readable. Um, how to know God, I think, is probably his most complicated one so far, having said that. Um, I've read quite a few of his books. Um, it sort of goes into quantum theories and um and and science in a in a sort of big way which i can't pretend to say that i get it all but having said that that it it's still a, a good read so what did he say we personify god as a convenient way of making him more like ourselves he would be a very perverse and cruel human however to remain so hidden from us while demanding our love what could possibly give us confidence in any kind of benevolent spiritual being when thousands of years of religion have been so stained by bloodshed? We need a model that is both part of religion and yet not bounded by it. OK, now Chopra came up with uh, seven stages of God, which I've attempted to sort of summarise here. Um, and in fact, really, each chapter of How to Know God deals with these things in turn. Now it's important here, although these are numbered, he never really intended it to be like one is better than the other. Um, he saw limitations if you only sort of could relate to God at one or two of these um, levels, particularly um, number one and two, but he acknowledges that at various points in our life we relate to God on or to spirituality at any rate, on all of these levels, um, or most of them maybe. Okay, I can see uh, resonances of Luke in some of these stages and I'll tell you uh, sort of where in a minute. Okay, so God the Protector um, is sort of typified by fear and struggle really. This is the kind of God that uh, is a tad unpredictable um, if you attribute tsunamis and volcanic eruptions and goodness knows what else um, to this God that, you know, um, that and, and, and everything seems chaotic and you're just clinging on to something and in, in the hope that it won't happen to you, um, then you're probably... Uh, responding to God at God the Protector level. Um, stage two is um, a little bit more developed, shall we say, in that um, if you're uh, competing to be the best, as it were, in your chosen field, um, then uh, you're probably relating to God the Almighty um, I've put justice in quotes here. This is because in uh, at this understanding of God, God rewards those who do the right thing and bad things only happen if you've somehow been disobedient to God. OK, um, there's a sense in which I suppose both of those are almost sort of justified responses. But uh, but Chopra sees the problem if you never get beyond that, okay? Um, and once you get to sort of stage three onwards and um, 
and and as I say, you know, this is this is not you know uh, uh, an order in which we go through. This is you know this is how we're hardwired and how we connect at various different times of our life. You know, while you're feeling fabulous, whatever you might be sort of relating to stage five or six or something, but at other points in your life when you're down or or whatever, then suddenly you're sort of fight or flight sort of um, mechanisms come into play and you know perhaps you're sort of a bit more sheltered and you know shut in and just thinking on you know stages one and two as, as it were but once you get to um, stage three which he called the god of peace um, by which you know we start to sort of connect to god at an inner level um, and that would include um, prayer, uh, insights um, that you perhaps have that um, you, that that you wouldn't have unless you were sort of you know in in a sort of reflective mode, as it were. Um, I've put Luke there because Luke's gospel uh, contains probably. Um, the most references to Jesus actually praying and some of the most famous prayers from the New Testament come from Luke, um, thinking of the Nunc Dimittis and the Magnificat and that sort of thing. Um, and it contains lots of instances of Jesus at prayer which aren't present in the other Gospels. Um, God the Redeemer, um, this is all about reconciliation really um and uh, uh the, the the obvious here is the is the god of christianity which is all about sort of buying back as it were lost souls um the cross the um uh, and, and the resurrection okay um when we are or feel sort of a at one with God through um, uh, works of art, creativity. Um, as God is a creator, so um, we're, we're sort of tapping into that aspect of God. Um, and you've, you've only got to necessarily be inspired by it um, recently, and this is going to sound very silly, but I was reading Paddington Bear and I thought, you know, this, you know, I'm I'm actually being touched as a human being here. And the very fact that I'm being touched as a human being is actually coming from God. You know, um, read Paddington Bear, folks. He's lovely. And uh, <laughs> you know, no one can fail to be moved, I think. I think you'd have to be, I don't know, a, a, a rock or something like that to not be. But it's about understanding that through creativity, we are working together um, with God, working you know, towards achieving godly purposes, as it were. Um, I've put in there me sometimes because um, I, when I play the piano well, um, I'm quite often in the zone. If you had to sit and suffer me practicing, you know, and getting stuck after bar three, then, you know, that's perhaps I'm not in the zone. But there are times where it's almost not me playing. The hands are there, the body's there in front of the piano, but and it almost doesn't even matter what notes I play, but there is something happening there. And it's not only touching what I'm doing, but it's having a, a positive effect on those people who are perhaps listening or joining in with singing and, and, and that sort of thing and and so I would attribute that to being in tune with God as a creator um, I put Luke in there because William Barclay suggests I love William Barclay and there's a lot of him in this presentation but William Barclay would suggest that um, that, that Luke was actually a good painter and that in his writing he's um, he, he writes in Greek and, you know, it's very good Greek and very descriptive um, language. And you'll see some of it um, as, uh, as as we progress through. Um, so I put him in there in, in that little bit. The God of Miracles requires a more visionary approach. Um, I've put a chap called Jeremy Gilly in there because uh, he is the, the chap behind uh, 
um, a movement called Peace One Day. And through him, he has um, he, he managed to get the United Nations to recognise September the 21st every year as a ceasefire day, a global ceasefire day. And um, once he, be, be, because of his vision of a world at peace, he couldn't stand the fact that, you know, everybody's griping at one another and what, what have you and fighting and whatever on, on a low level, individual level and on a, um, a, a global level. And he actually had a vision in his mind and set out to do something about it. And one of the remarkable things that's happened, and this is going beyond boundaries here, um, is um, how he managed to get the, um, the, the, the Taliban in Afghanistan to cease hostilities for one day, on peace one day, so that loads of kids um, who wouldn't be able to get to certain places, uh, to hospitals, could actually get vital vaccinations that they needed. Um, and that kind of thinking goes along, I think, with the God of Miracles. It's about it's about crossing boundaries because there are nature's boundaries here that are crossed as well. But it's understanding that I am not just this, you know, this English person sitting here in England trying to, you know, sort of struggle for my own existence here, that I'm part of a bigger thing. OK, and part seven uh, the God of pure being. I don't really fully understand this, actually, um, but it's just understanding God as he is. Um, it's unlimited. Um, it's just being at one with God. Um, and I've put divine ecstasy in there because um, some people would uh, would sort of have it that sort of chanting God's names, for example, is one way of bringing about this sort of being with God and just and just existing with God, not as part of, because we're not God, but we are part and parcel of in that he is within us and therefore, um, you know, it, it, it's just realising that and, and sort of tuning into that sort of level of him. OK, um, so that's Deepak Chopra. OK, I'm not suggesting that everybody should agree with that, um, but it's something that I'd like you to hold whilst I take you on a quick whistle stop through um, the whole of Luke chapter 13. I'm going to focus at the end. I'm going to focus on the bit that I'm actually supposed to be talking about on in a couple of weeks time. But I believe that you need to know what's leading up to it um, in order to sort of fully comprehend why that passage is there and, and, and what it's actually doing. All right. So Luke 13, how to and how not to know God. OK, um, the, the first part is um, Jesus being a bit political. And there are two disasters that he's talking about here. Now, um, the Romans wanted to uh, build a new sort of water system in Jerusalem. Um, and... Um, that was all well and good, except that they wanted to use the, the the money collected in the temple to go towards paying for this thing. And um, a lot of uh, Jewish people living in Galilee at the time wouldn't have it. And they protested quite a lot. And in order to quell this protesting, um, Roman soldiers were instructed to carry cudgels instead of swords and... Um, put cloaks over their uniforms and sort of go incognito and sort of try and quell this uprising and they acted far beyond what they were sort of supposed to do and you know basically they caused you know a scene of carnage which was sort of you know quite well known okay and there's another bit of a disaster that went on when 18 people who were sort of drafted in to work um on these aqueducts. Now we don't know too much about these two disasters, so I'm sort of sort of putting two and two here to make five here a little bit. But a tower at a place called Siloam fell, if that's how you say it, um, and 18 people were killed. And the popular thought was that were these two disasters sort of 
part of God's wrath, okay? Was it because these people were terrible sinners that they came to their end, okay? Partly because, if we just go back a second, these people that were killed when uh, the tower fell uh, were basically, beca because they were being paid by the Romans who'd taken the temple money to pay for this, they were, in, in essence, owing money to God, as it were. OK, and so um, Jesus is saying to them, you know, do you think this is God's wrath? Do you think that these people that were killed are any worse than you? OK, and in a sense, he is challenging them at stage one and two. Is this God killing people for disobeying him? OK, um, and his answer was actually no. These people are no worse than you are. But unless you repent, and I've put the, the meaning of the word repent here, um, it literally means rethink. Uh, the pent is like pensive, um, sort of thoughtful, okay? So think again, okay? Know God differently because you don't, you're not understanding him if that's what you think, okay? In fact, as William Stringfellow would have it, you're all morally dead, basically. Um, if you go along with your thoughts about God being this great big sort of bully boy, almost, that, that basically obliterates anybody that sort of crosses his path, you know, if you think that God is so materialistic as all that, as to care about money, then, you know, and these Galileans were also known as for being sort of rather hot-headed. And his suggestion was that if you don't change the way you, if you don't change the way you're thinking, then you are going to be doomed. But it will be your doing because of, you know, the way that these events are going, you know, the Romans are basically going to have the lot of you. Um, and so... There was this, it, it, it's not a great sort of spiritual thing here. It's, it, it's kind of like, you know, just, just get a grip for a moment here. Calm down a bit and just try and understand God from a slightly different perspective. And it might, you know, you might actually learn something, folks, basically. Okay, so next in Luke, we have this parable of the fig tree. Now, um, the soil, I'm told, again by Mr. Barclay, um, in Galilee at the time, was pretty, or well, or Palestine, was for the most part pretty sort of um, bad soil. Not an awful lot could grow there. You, few vineyards, few olive trees, few fig trees. The fig tree was one of the most robust sort of um, uh, plants that could grow. OK, but this particular fig tree growing in this vineyard was not bearing fruit. And um, a gentleman came up to the master of the vineyard and said, basically, well, look, you know, this is wasting good soil here. You know, how many times I've put here, you know, how many times have you been called a waste of space or using up valuable air? You know, um, and, you know, let's get rid of it. Let's, you know, let's put something new there that will grow. Um, and Jesus, was, uh, and, and Jesus, as he's telling the story, um, has the, the master of the vineyard saying, well, look, you know, let's, let's give it another year. You know, <coughs> typically these trees took three years to grow. And he's saying, look, give it another year. And if by then it hasn't shown any fruit, then let's, you know, we'll deal with it then. OK, now the the implication in this little parable, as it were, is kind of, you know, to make way for something that will grow. OK, it's not exactly stated sort of um, in so many words, but 
there is always this temptation and I always I, I read these things and I have to sort of do a double take I'm not entirely in agreement with Barclay's suggestion um, basically that you know um, th that this applies to human beings but I do think that it applies to certain religious systems here okay I've put down coded references because Although Jesus was a very outspoken man, the parables were used as a way of sort of making um, sort of digs at certain parts of society in order to make them sort of change their ways, turn them upside down, as it were. But he could never really be too explicit. There was a sense that at points in his life he was saving his own skin. Yes, he knew he had to die, but it was going to be on his terms um, and not at the at the wrong time. And so he sort of said things and I uh, uh, think, what? Um, uh, just to sort of, um, you know, just not cause too much trouble, but to have a, have a little prod, okay? And I believe here that this is, really the law the organized religion that is that is um having a dig at here i've put the sower and the seeds in brackets because again whenever i hear the sower and the seeds i sometimes think oh my god you know am i falling on am i a seed that's fallen on bad ground and, and or have i fallen on nice ground or whatever and you're almost thinking you know is it the ground's fault? And I don't believe that a, a, a farmer um, would just chuck his seeds up in the air and you know a, a, and hope that they landed somewhere. In the same way that the word of God, as it were, um, is not just sort of chucked in the air and you know a, a, and land somewhere. It only lands there because that's where God wanted it. The seeds only land there because that's where the farmer wants it. A tree's only planted there because that's where it's where we want it to grow. But the problem is not so much where they land, but what happens once it's actually trying to grow, okay? And that is where the bad teaching comes in here. Um, and, you know, what, what is going on is that you've got these people being terrified, basically, by a God at stages one and two, a vengeful, wrathful bully boy that punishes people for doing wrong things and they're not having any kind of education into deeper things, okay? If the tree, if the fig tree is not, um, it, it, it is not producing fruit, then you, we'll put something there that is, okay? If a, a religious system is not having the desired results. Yes, we'll, 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 we'll sort of give it a chance, but ultimately, correct understanding will have to be sort of, um, you, you know, we'll, we'll have to make sure that these people get the right sort of education somehow, you know, because this was people's education that, that is at stake, that's at stake here as well. I've gone on a bit about the fig tree, but I think I do believe it's very important. Okay. Um, now, uh, in uh, verses ten to seventeen, we have a woman being healed on the Sabbath. My goodness me. Okay. Uh, I've put Chopra stage six here because this is all about miracles. Um, but we've also got a sense here of lots of boundaries being crossed. Okay. Um, it was against the law to do any work on the Sabbath. And Jesus had flouted that law, according to the uh, the, the leader of the synagogue. OK. Um, this woman had been in pain for most of her adult life by the text. Um, and, uh, uh, and basically Jesus saw, knew what he could do at that time, was aware of his power, knew how to use it and essentially healed the um the, the woman okay luke is telling us because luke um was essentially a gentile really okay that means he wasn't really 
you know, part of the same religion as, you know, uh, uh, as the Jews. He was a Greek man um, and he was telling this story as saying, look, Jesus isn't just for Jews, you know, he's for everybody, okay? And so this story suddenly goes in here. Um, we've got, um, you know, the moral law being broken, as it were, the, the, the religious law that um, people were sort of kept in check by. We've got natural laws being broken, okay? Um, and the synagogue leader couldn't bring himself round to actually talking to Jesus himself because he thought he would get into, I suppose, um, trouble. So he crossed the boundary, okay? But... And I've left some dot, 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 dots here. You know, this was only to get him out of a situation, okay? He spoke to a woman, okay? And as you'll see later on, that was sort of seen as quite taboo, okay? Um, and it was... He, and he only did that because he didn't want to sort of get himself snared by Jesus. But Jesus' response was, well, look, for goodness sake... You know, we've got this woman, she's been suffering for 18 years, I think was the was how many, however many years it was. Look, I can do this. You know, you, it's, you know, you sort of forbid any harm or danger coming to animals. You'll take your animals out to water on the Sabbath. Why can't I do this for her? And there was really nothing that the man could actually say in response, okay? Um... The kingdom of God is like then a mustard seed. When planted, it becomes a big tree. And that tree becomes a haven for the birds. Now, the birds of the air, you know, as as we know, they just sort of, you know, they, they fly from country to country, from warm place to cold place, to, you know, for, for whatever reason. And they come from all the corners of the earth in order to do so. And... Um, the kingdom of God then is therefore like um, uh, somewhere where everybody from every nation, from every belief, every colour, every creed, every social strata um, and, you know, and people who have done every kind of sin imaginable can all come and find refuge and find, um, and find life. OK, this is Chopra at stage six seeing across all these kind of fictional boundaries, as it were, that we try and sort of live our lives in, um, in order to take risks and to achieve life, to achieve love, you do have to take risks, okay? Um, and so that's, you know, a, a very good illustration of um, uh, of Luke leading people onto a deeper understanding of what God's about. Also adding yeast to dough. One of the interpretations of this is that by adding the yeast to the dough, you've got a piece of sort of, you know, a, a lump of inanimate dough as such. But by a tiny little bit of yeast being added to the dough, the, the dough will rise and create this huge loaf of bread, as it were. OK, and um, <coughs> Jesus sort of gives the quantities here, really, in, in biblical sort of um, in, in the text. And it's of, a, of, you know, this tiny little bit of yeast becoming this great big loaf of bread. OK, so it's about generosity. It's about transformation, but it's also about having to actually disturb the status quo in order to be able to achieve this thing. OK, um, there was a lot wrong with society, hence my use of the words morally dead earlier on. OK, um, it needs to be transformed. OK, it's not about obliterating it all and starting again. It's about transforming what's there, seeing what's good already, being patient and caring, like giving the fig tree a chance, as it were, saving what's good, but also sort of replacing the bad as it were, you know, pruning off the dead leaves, as it were, to try and sort of make something that is that, that is deeper and and more sort of lasting.
Do I mean last thing? I don't know. Okay, so now we come to the passage that I'm actually supposed to be talking about, and I've probably gone on for about half a million years, and I do apologise. I won't on the day, I promise. Um, it, I've put a question mark by the reference because some Bibles only have this going up to 31 to 34. The NIV, I think, only goes up to 34. At least the one that I accessed online only went up to 34. But it still says the same thing. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus. Depart, they said to him, and get on your way from this place, because Herod is out to kill you. Go, he said, and tell that fox, look you, I cast out demons and I work cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day my work is perfected. I must be on my way today and tomorrow and the next day, because it is not possible for a prophet to perish out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Killer of prophets, stoner of those who were sent to you. How often I wanted to gather together your children as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Look you, your house is desolate. I tell you, you will not see me until you shall say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now you might see why you need the, 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 sort of the, the preparation that goes up to sort of getting to this, to this passage. Okay. Um, it's not an easy one to kind of just take on its own, okay? Given that we're talking about sort of uh, leading people to a deeper understanding of the nature of God, showing how in our daily lives by, by healing and by, you know, talking about nurturing and caring and that sort of thing, um, this is... It, it, this is the culmination of that, okay? Now, here comes the big Pharisee quiz, okay? Um, again, William Barclay is responsible for um, these definitions, really. The, uh, um, you, you know, although, like to us, we read the New Testament and we understand how... Um, you know how hypocritical these Pharisees are. So did the the the, the, the average person at at the time. They might not have necessarily been as bold as us, but so did they. And they had some nicknames for the various types of different Pharisee that you come across. Okay. Now, um, for the purposes of this YouTube video, I'll tell you what they are. Okay. But it will be a quiz on the day. I promise. Okay. So we have the shoulder Pharisee. This is uh, the kind of Jewish religious leader who would carry their good deeds around on their shoulder for everybody to see. The wait a little Pharisee, philosophy behind that was why do a good deed today when you can do it tomorrow. The bruised and bleeding Pharisee, this is a very interesting one, okay, um, I mentioned women earlier, um, Pharisees were not supposed to talk to women, at least they weren't supposed to be seen in public as talking to women, um, and they also um, some of them went as so, so far as to not even look at them um, in public. And so they used to cover their eyes. When they covered their eyes, they quite often knock into walls and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And then they would let people see all the, all the cuts and things that they sort of accrued from knocking into walls so that everybody knew that they'd done their, their, their duty and not looked at the women. So, hence the bruised and bleeding Pharisee. The pestle and mortar or humpback Pharisee was basically somebody that walked around in some kind of cringing position so that, uh, so that they were, you know, trying to kid themselves that, and, and kid everybody else that they were actually very humble, okay? The ever-reckoning Pharisee was the one who clocked up all their good deeds, hoping that, you know, somehow or other, um, by accounting for their good deeds on earth, that God would also be doing the same and, you know, you know, somehow, you know, points mean prizes sort of thing. The timid or fearing Pharisee was a kind of Pharisee that um, was kind of like haunted by religion, um, a bit like stage one of Chopra's thing here, okay? And finally, the God-loving Pharisee, yes, you know, the, um, the, 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 um, people at some you know at Jesus's time did act actually acknowledge that some of those exist and it's just um such a Pharisee that um is possibly here kind of you know a well-meaning Pharisee shall we say here that is trying to warn Jesus in this passage get out of Jerusalem you're in danger here get out 
Okay, and then Jesus replies, go and tell the crafty fox. Well, who's the crafty fox? Um, again, Mr. Barclay would have it that this was King Herod Antipas. Okay, um, I don't know who his uncle was. That's a joke, by the way. Um, uh, you know, hence my title, okay, with the kings in the title, okay. Jesus says, let's just whistle back a bit here, go and tell that fox, okay, that crafty thing, basically. I love foxes, by the way. I know they're not extremely popular, but I love them, and I'm sure Jesus does as well. Um, but look, here we've got all sorts of symbols of hope here in amongst um, in amongst all the sort of the doom and gloom, there is hope. And in a sense, you know, it's it's almost a no-brainer, okay? Um, you know, I'm not going to take the easy way out here, okay? Um, in a way, it's a bit like a mini book of Revelation, is this chapter, okay? All sorts of oblique references that people at that time, we're only halfway through Luke's Gospel here, not many people would have understood his or come to terms with the fact that Jesus knew he was going to die and knew the circumstances under which he was going to die and still less understood anything about the resurrection. But here we have here lots of references, OK? First of all, I tell you, you'll not see me until you shall say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, when did they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? When they were shouting Hosanna, when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, not as a great king, but as a pauper on a donkey. Um, and that's, you know, him leading up to his death. But we also have the <coughs> references to the third day when my work is perfected. OK, OK. Killer of the prophets, stoner of those who were sent to you. You know, you don't understand, you know, you're not reading the signs properly. You know, further back in this chapter, I didn't talk about sort of in detail, but there were references to, you know, you can look at the sky and see what the weather's going to be, but you can't see the signs that are going on now and and see what you know what the kingdom of god is like here i am doing all these miracles working cures casting out demons whatever you want to call it there i am i'm doing it and you know look i'm you, you know i'm putting my life on the line here you're telling me that there are people who want to kill me you know um but nevertheless this has to be done in order that my work is perfected okay um, I don't like dwelling on the violence of the crucifixion because although that's a, that was a necessary thing that had to happen in you know in, you know for, for the Christian story to actually you know um, be um, understood. <coughs> what what is actually really important is that what is what comes out of it. It's life. It's yeast in unleavened bread, basically, um, and. You know, it, it's, it's painful at the time. You know, the, the, the yeast, you know, it was not a sort of dumb thing. A lot of people at that time didn't like putting yeast into bread. Um, and But, it, you know, th th this was something that had to be done in order for, you know, the, the, this great transformation to come about. OK, I've waffled far too long. Um, and yes, I'll have to sort of reduce my waffling. Um, in order not to bore everybody senseless when I actually do this presentation. Um, thank you if you managed to stay to the end. OK, I've got a final quote for you. Getting close to God through a true knowing heals the fear of death, confirms the existence of the soul and gives ultimate meaning to life. And I believe that Luke 13 is his way of correcting a lot of people's misunderstandings about God, trying to lead people into a deeper understanding. Okay, thank you.